Hi, I'm Mitch Bollinger. I'm going to be talking about the sharp style analysis today. Uh, I know there's been some discussion recently about how to think about evaluating the performance of various portfolios, and uh, my observation is that I think some people could uh, could learn a little bit more about the sharp style analysis, and in my opinion, uh, realize the genius of the sharp style analysis. And the great advantage is that instead of trying to make up your own uh, benchmark for a portfolio, uh, a lot of times, uh, essentially, if you want to show that your portfolio is outperformed, the key to doing that is to create a benchmark that uh, has less risk than the portfolio that you are evaluating the performance of. What this does is it uses the return of that portfolio to tell you what the uh, what the benchmark should be. So it really sort of cuts through the uh, the game of trying to uh, create a, a less risky portfolio. Uh, starting off, uh, the Sharp Style Analysis is named after William Sharp, who of course is a uh, luminary of the finance industry and also a Nobel Prize winner. So I would suggest that uh, when he wrote about this initially, it is well worth the read because uh, he is uh, so influential in setting what would be the, uh, I would call it the foundation for today's modern finance. And so this is a quick Wikipedia page on him. Uh, here is the initial paper that he wrote. You can just do a quick Google for uh, sharp style analysis. Uh, and when we get to the page, there's something that's highlighted here that I'd like to read, which I think gives you a good idea of what he thought this could be used for. Uh, once a procedure for measuring exposures to variations and returns of major asset classes is in place, it is possible to determine how effectively individual fund managers have performed their function and the extent, if any, to which value has been added through active management. So certainly, uh, William Sharp thought this would be a good analytical tool to to measure the alpha created by a portfolio. So if we quickly run through here, give you a, a real fast overview, uh, what he did is broke out the world into the different factors that he thought were the major factors that contributed to returns. So he starts up here with uh, government bonds, uh, government bills, uh, looks at the term structure here, uh, corporate bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, and then he breaks stocks into U.S., European stocks, and Japanese stocks. In the U.S., he further breaks stocks out by style. Now we go down here to see this diagram. Essentially, this is him showing uh, how he breaks U.S. stocks out by style. Uh, scrolling down a little bit more, he talks about uh, the optimization that you're doing. Is What you're trying to do is set up the portfolio the style analysis such that it explains as most of, as possible of the actual portfolio that you're measuring the performance of. Uh, he goes down here and uh, what he also gets into is suggests that over time you could run multiple of these analysis to see how style changes over time. Anyway, we don't need to get too much further into this. Uh, what I'm trying to cover is just uh, generally what it's doing and, and why I think it is underused in the industry. Uh, some other great resources out here. Uh, here's a, an interview that he did on the style analysis. Again, you just Google Sharp Style Analysis. This will pop right, right up. Um, you know, Wikipedia has a page on return-based style analysis. And then on the level three of the CFA exam, they get a lot into performance uh, measurement and analysis. And these are some notes that I found uh, for the level three that really gets into some of this stuff. Um, it's really helpful. Now, what we're going to do next is what I think is the most, I think it's really interesting and in my mind explains the genius of the Stark Sharp Style Analysis. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to create, we're going to simulate a portfolio uh, and then we're going to take those returns, only the returns of those portfolio, of the portfolio we've simulated, and then apply a Sharp st Style Analysis. What we're going to do is see how good a Sharp Style Analysis is at estimating what the known portfolio that was simulated, um, we're going to see how good that analysis is at, at, at figuring out what this portfolio is really made of. So we'll see if we can fool it. And uh, the point being is I think it's a pretty neat tool to be able to give some insight into how useful this can really be.
So we have a, a spreadsheet. I'm going to make this available on a link below. Uh, on the first page here, this is a portfolio construction. So basically what we're doing is we're going to create a portfolio. We've taken, we've broken U.S. stocks out into six different buckets. Uh, we've uh, split them by size and value versus growth. So here are your, you would call it like your six style buckets. Um, then we have your the indices for each style. Now, if we go to this chart here, what this does is this uh, charts each of these styles uh, over time. And as you can see, there is a large divergence. And the whole reason for doing this is let's say you're a small cap value investor. And your job is to try to find, uh, you know, try to create alpha, but only investing in small cap uh, value stocks. So for instance, we see that small cap uh, value has been the laggard over this time period. Now, let's say you create, you outperformed, uh, you know, the, your benchmark, the small cap value. So let's say your performance is, you know, somewhere up here. Well, you really did create value um, because the pool in which you were selecting stocks, um, you found ones that outperformed similar stocks. But if you compare it to like the S&P 500, um, it's likely you would have underperformed because you know we see that these big growth stocks have just absolutely killed the other stocks in the last couple of years. So it would be unfair to judge you against uh, stocks that you didn't, you, you couldn't choose from. And that's the whole point of thinking about this. Uh, further, um, you know there are now ETFs out there that invest each of these different styles. So if you wanted to get exposure to any one of these individual styles, you can just go find, you know, one of these ETFs from uh, BlackRock or Vanguard, or there's no shortage of other people who create these ETFs, but you could get it for, you know, 10, 12, 15 basis points, something that's, you know, relatively inexpensive. So the question is, um, you know, you don't want to pay for something that you could otherwise get for just a few basis points. So, uh, go into the spreadsheet a little bit more and you see that there's instructions here on how to do it all but what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk, walk you through uh, the first example. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just create an evenly balanced portfolio and these are the cells here where you tell it where you want to create uh, you know, create a simulated portfolio. Uh, here's where you put in the noise and your alpha. So we'll start by creating a portfolio that has uh, a 5% annual standard deviation. This is sort of the random noise that sits on top of the portfolio, which is intended to, uh, let's say you're uh, an active manager, um, you know, you're going to have some inherent variation in there just because uh, you're not mirroring the, uh, the index. Then we'll start with an annual alpha of zero. So basically saying you go and pick a bunch of stocks, you have no skill, um, and this is the portfolio that you randomly come up with. Now, one of the things we're going to do here with our random number generator, this is a dynamic formula. So um, if we run it while we are, uh, while this is still dynamically creating the portfolio, it's going to be this big feedback loop and it's, you know, it's not going to work real well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these random numbers and we're going to paste them in here such that the uh, random portfolio with randomness, the random number is hard coded in. So as we run our optimization, uh, you're not going to have the random number continually uh, generating. So uh, here we have, uh, this is our white line, which is the simulated portfolio we just created. Uh, you know, it's right about in the middle of all these stocks. And the reason why is uh, because we created an equally weighted portfolio of all of them. So it makes sense that it's sort of right in the middle. Now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, here's our performance evaluation page. So essentially what we have here is we have a simulated portfolio index here and then we can choose to do either a monthly analysis or an annual analysis. And the whole point of this is to demonstrate that if you do either of them you're going to get a very similar answer. So scroll down to the bottom here. Uh, this is uh, these numbers here drive what the fitted portfolio is. So what we're going to do is use the solver in Excel and we're going to try to maximize the R squared, which is, you know, think of this as we want to create a model that best reflects the simulated portfolio. So we're going to our solver here. Uh, so our objective. So this is the R squared of the, uh, of the monthly uh, fitted model. Uh, we want to maximize that and we want to change cells. So here are the cells that 
uh, basically the, the different uh, styles that we can choose from. And then we constrain it by saying each one of these allocations is going to be between 0 and 1%. Excuse me. And then uh, this constraint here, what this tells us is that we're going, we want to constrain it such that uh, all of them add up to 100%. So let's see what we get. Okay, well, let's analyze the results. So we know we created a portfolio that was equally uh, balanced. So 16.7 for, for each one of these buckets. Now our optimization, uh, it tells us that uh, it's, its best guess is that, you know, for small growth, we're about 17.3% and so forth. Now, what you can see is that they were pretty darn close to the equal allocation we had. So the point being is that the style analysis is really pretty darn good at uh, estimating what the what the actual portfolio was. Then we go up to the estimated alpha. So this estimates uh, with this portfolio that we had an alpha of 0.15%, but we know that the actual alpha was zero. So the p-value is, you know, what this is testing is what's the chance that the actual uh, the actual alpha was not zero. And what we see is that we're actually getting pretty close to thinking that the actual alpha was not zero. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the nature of statistics. I tell you what, let's go do this again. Uh, let's take another set of random numbers here paste that in here and let's run the optimization again and see what it shows all right so what this shows is that uh, the estimated alpha is actually negative 0.12 percent remember this is now all just due to random variation because we know that the actual alpha is zero and the p-value of 0 0.10 tells us that it is very unlikely that the true alpha is negative so these are the sort of things that you can do to, and play around with it, but I think it gives you a good idea of, uh, of how this works. Um, and here's where I think it gets really interesting. So this was sort of your, your easy start here. Uh, let's just go make up a portfolio. So let's say we're going to have a value manager, generally small cap value, but on occasion it sort of sneaks into, uh, sneaks into neutral size. So let's just create a portfolio with uh, uh, zero small growth, uh, let's say let's 10% neutral, 35% small value, let's say 35% big value. Let's see what do we have left. Uh, all right, well, let's say, actually, let's just do this number. All right, so basically it's, um, you know, value to, to neutral stocks, uh, but this gives us 100%. Uh, uh, let's say still an annual standard deviation of 5%, but let's say we're actually, we're really good. Um, we have skill where we can pick stocks such that the average alpha is one. So again, we go in here, we take our pasted random numbers and we put them in there because we don't want the, the solver to, uh, to iterate forever and give us bogus numbers. So let's see what we do to the values. Okay, so this is what we're starting with our old model here and we're starting from zero. So again, we do the exact same thing. What does this give us? All right. Well, this gives us an R squared of 99.96%. So almost all of the returns can be explained by this model that we've come up with. And let's go and see how well the model's done at uh, selecting the different styles. Well, okay. So we were actually 15% in small neutral, or we're real close to that. Again, real small, close to small value. Well, we knew we were big growth, but, you know, we, we loaded on that a little bit. Uh, a, a bit of a, uh, an aside here, you can do some other statistical analysis, something called like a lasso analysis. What it does is it, it shrinks anything that, that's close to zero, basically says it's probably zero. So if you wanted to go down that rabbit hole of getting more statistically uh, sophisticated, you could do that. But in the meantime, this works pretty darn well as it is. Um, so the point being is uh, we get really close to uh, the actual portfolio we created. And then let's go to the actual, the estimated alpha. All right. Well, the estimated alpha is 1.04%. So we know that the, the actual alpha is 1, and sure as heck, we're pretty close to it. Now, the p-value says what's the probability that the actual alpha is, um, that the actual alpha is, 
uh, not zero, and it says yes, it's extremely likely that the true alpha is not uh, zero. And this is, and we know that true alpha is one, so yes, this is, uh, you know, this is why you use these statistical tools. Now, here's where I think it gets even a little more interesting. Let's say you are a, let's say you're just a, a, an all value investor, right? So this is what you would, you know, you would expect, your, your, your benchmark would be. Um, and, and someone says, okay, we are going to, you know, we know this is a value investor, so we're going to benchmark against, uh, you know, 50% in small value, 50% in big value, because they told us that they're a value investor. But let's say you get a little sneaky, right? Um, and let's say you decided a little while ago that you wanted to be in 10% growth, but you didn't tell anybody. So, if that's the case, then your then your benchmark would say, oh, another thing is, but let's say that you really have no skill. You are not creating any annual alpha. Now, if we do that and we have our dyn our uh, static model where we just said, hey, listen, we're not going to do a style analysis. We are going to assume that yes, they, they said they were all value. Um, so we create our benchmark such as such that uh, it is 50% small value, 50% big value. We say, my gosh, they created uh, an alpha of 0.92%. They are doing terrific. This is a great manager. The p-value is 0.691. So it's really close to statistical significance. But we know that this is not what the manager is doing because they said they were doing one thing and do another. If we created, you know, if we didn't close the loop and use a sharp style analysis, they could fool us. But this is why we have the style analysis. So let's run this thing again. Well, what does it tell us? Lo and behold, it tells us this manager was not all value. It tells us that this manager was 10% in growth. And the estimated alpha is now 0.04%, which is really close to the true alpha. So this style analysis is, in my opinion, far superior to creating a, uh, a benchmark that doesn't look, that doesn't use the time series of these returns and tell us what the benchmark should be. So I just think it's, a, it's far superior to uh, using an external benchmark and just sort of coming up with that uh, because that leads to, you know, it leads to creating a benchmark that oftentimes reflects lower risk than the portfolio or the fund is taking. Therefore, uh, essentially, it goal seeks the positive alpha. Um, you know, I'll put this spreadsheet online. You can go and play with it a bunch of different ways. I mean, a bunch of different things you can do is, uh, you know, run the uh, optimizing the R squared of monthly returns, uh, change it to the R squared of annual returns. You're going to see that you get a very similar answer. Um, and then if we take this a step further, of course, this is a very simple example, um, going back to what uh, William Sharp did in his initial paper. Uh, he didn't just use U.S. stocks. He basically looked at the whole universe of where returns com could come from, and he put all of them in here. But it's, it's the exact same idea, um, and that's why I think it's just far superior to, uh, uh, you know, making, you know, creating your own benchmark because, you know, that, that leads to uh, people defining down the risks that they're taking. So, uh, you know, take a look at the spreadsheet, play around with it, and, uh, you know, leave some comments. Let me know what you think. Feel free to shoot me a message. Um, I'd love to hear what you think.